I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Mission Matters Business, your source for all things business. If you'd like to apply to be a guest on the show, head on over to missionmatters.com and click on Be Our Guest to Apply. All right, so today I have Jeremy McCool on the line, and he is the founder and CEO over at Hevo. Jeremy, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Oh, man, Jeremy. So I'm pumped about today's episode. As we were talking in the pre-show, I said, I'm from Michigan. I'm from the Midwest. I'm a car guy. So I get to talk about cars today on the show. This is exciting. And let alone EV, like that's a big deal. And uh, we have some, some news, some announcements that you have going on with the company. And uh, we're also going to do a demo, which I think is a special treat for our audience. Um, but just to get us kicked off, tell me, so how did you get started in this world of EV? Well, first, to speak on the part of electric vehicles, let me start by saying that, you know, it's really a market that's just beginning, and it's overturning a 100-year-old market, an industry that hasn't changed. Uh, I know you're from the Detroit area, right? Absolutely. What's your favorite car? Uh, I grew up with a lot of Mustangs, a lot of Fords. Yeah, same here. I was a muscle car uh, guy. Our family is muscle cars. But... I'm guessing, have you had a chance to drive a Tesla or any other EV at this point? So I've ridden in quite a few and they are nice, man. It, it's kind oh, yeah. of scary to me because growing up in the in the in the muscle car side of things, like you you mentioned, we normally have uh, uh, like that loud, that rumble if you're in a classic car. So when you have a Tesla on and you hear nothing, it's like, whoa, it's interesting. Yeah, it is. The performance, that instant acceleration, that's what really makes it so exciting for me. And that's how, that's what got me into this whole thing. I got to see a Tesla Roadster in 2011 and I was immediately sold. I knew that this was gonna change the world and I wanted to be a part of it, so I got to work. It was while I was at Columbia University, I was studying urban policy and sustainable development and I really got lost into this whole idea of how do you accelerate electric vehicle, electric vehicle adoption? And I started to look at, well, what's missing? Infrastructure. You need charging infrastructure. The vehicles will sell themselves, but you've gonna, you're going to have to charge somewhere. And you don't want to leave people you know, out in charging deserts without their ability to charge. So when I started to look at what was missing from that was really... How do you charge an electric vehicle, but make it universal, ubiquitous, and easy? And that's when the idea of wireless charging emerged. And it wasn't like this is new technology. We're talking about also 100-year-old technology. Nikola Tesla is the godfather of energy, and specifically wireless charging. So it's not as if we've created something that hasn't existed. It's been existing in our lives for 100 plus years. And what a great point that the company namesake Tesla will see a wireless charging technology from a person, Nikola Tesla, to come into the market in this upcoming year. I, I know that it doesn't mean that Tesla is going to be exactly using wireless charging right out the gate, but we're starting to see these things roll over. So when we look at why we exist, it is because very simply, we make ownership of electric vehicles better. What it really means is, is that we are at the impetus of a new acceleration of electric mobility, and we're really excited about what's coming up. So what I think what I think about when I see the problem or the uh, the challenge that the industry has, it's not unlike when the adoption of uh, of of cars started becoming widespread. Right. You need to build gas stations. I mean, simply put, right. You needed vehicles to have gas stations so that they could fill up and and uh, and function and, and 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 be a benefit versus, you know, a hindrance. And th somebody thinking about is their gas tank filled or are they going to run out of gas? Right. So they, it grew. 
um, pretty naturally there. And so when I think about the charger stations and number one, it's a much cleaner proposition than what we are doing in the past building, uh, building these, these gas stations, right? Uh, but number two, I guess one of the challenges is, is just gonna be the adoption rate as people continue buying these, these cars, right? Um, which is gonna, in my opinion, the technology is getting better, like they're getting better um, and they're, they're just more fun. I mean, they're beautiful cars. Tesla's a beautiful car. Um, when you think about that, like the challenge of the adoption rate versus the capacity for these charger stations, like Whole Foods in Malibu, I'll tell you, there's always a line there always a line for like those nine like electric vehicle charging spots and there's always like two or three teslas just waiting to park um so tell me a little bit more about how that buildup can look first is that when you look at the market today there's about five million electric vehicles around the world on roadways and forecasts show that we will see that rise to upwards of 130 million electric vehicles by 2030 so in just a decade we're going to see monstrous growth in this industry. The second part of that is that currently there's only about a million public charging stations available. Mm. And we're going to see that grow to about 40 million electric vehicle charging stations publicly by 2030. So both of these industries are obviously working in parallel with each other on purpose. We need to make sure that there is an easy, accessible, ubiquitous way to be able to charge electric vehicles and that in the purpose of e-mobility, what we're really gonna see is that the public charging station is gonna become the new gas filling station. Mm -hmm. And very likely, a lot of those old convenience stores and gas filling stations will have electric vehicle charging for the right purpose, but it doesn't really cover enough because people don't drive their vehicles 24 hours a day. They typically drive them for one to two hours per day. So 20 to 22 hours, the vehicle's just sitting somewhere. And if that's at work or if that's at home or if that's at the grocery store or wherever it may be, there really needs to be EV charging there to make it a point of destination charging. And that will relieve that early range anxiety of early adopters as well, because at the end of the day, you can get a better performing vehicle for about the same price as any other internal combustion engine vehicle, but you don't have the convenience of the ability to be able to fill those vehicles the way that you can with ICE vehicles today. You have to get it more into the purpose of being an EV charging network. And so that's where we are focused on is trying to utilize the existing infrastructure and the networking that does exist and then supercharge it to becoming wireless ready which i think is amazing and i think it makes the adoption rate of these vehicles potentially faster and for people that do want them and have that little bit of what well, i believe the term is you said range anxiety so to kind of cure some of that like faster so that we can we can have more of these cars on the road so i think it's a great thing uh, let's go into, I want to talk a little bit more about some of the regulation side of things and like sure. how that's working out because, well, first off, congrats. I understand that you had some great tests in this uh, SAE test recently. Tell us a little bit more about that just to get us started. So SAE, the Society of Automotive Engineers, are the ones that are responsible for setting forth the standards for interoperability between technologies, especially for charging electric vehicles. To date, all the plug and charging equipment has been certified mostly through SAE, which is really an international body of electric vehicle manufacturers and tier ones and regulators. But the SAE committee that was stood up for wireless EV charging took 13 years to put together the entire universal package because it was a hundred plus member body that included again, automakers, tier ones, regulators, and then design and developers such as Hevo. What really was at the end of this is, is that just like wireless charging is for your mobile phone, where you can take a mobile phone with wireless charging and dock it on a wireless dock anywhere in the world, and you don't have to have an additional adapter or anything for that. That's what's at the heart of this standard, this SAE, what's known as the J2954 standard. And what it really gets down to is, is that somebody should be able to drive their vehicle 
and charge on any station made by any developer or producer without any worry of it not charging. And that's not what exists today with plug-in charging. Today, there's over a dozen different standards for plug-in charging. And in the United States alone, you'll see six to eight different standards depending on where you are coast to coast. With wireless charging, you go to any station that has wireless charging, it doesn't matter, it will charge. So about three weeks ago, this standard was officially ratified and standardized and published. And that immediately put into, you know, really the works of what's gonna happen next. But Hevo back in January of this year, we became the first company in the world to satisfactorily be able to meet the electromagnetic field and EMI requirements. And we also tested interoperability successfully with one of our primary competitors. So it put us in a real good spot, really, to be able to move things along from our point of view. But there's another standard out there called UL, or Underwriters Laboratories. And that is the standard that's required to be able to safely produce, manufacture, and commercialize charging technology. And UL is really the Rolls Royce of standards uh, and certification. Anything that's connected to the grid goes through UL. So UL really is a parallel uh, path with the SAE and they follow the same requirements, but what UL does is ensure that the composition, the materials, the hermetic uh, capabilities of the technology meets all the safety that anybody would want to have if they were going to deploy these, whether it's in their home or at work or in a public streetway. And we were one of the only two companies in the world to successfully pass those tests uh, back in August. And when, when we did, uh, three weeks later, we had already sold out for 2021 in terms of what our plant production capacity was. So wow. uh, it means something to people. Uh, people that understand what UL means and what SAE means, it's very important to them. And the fact that Hevo is the only company in the world that has done both to date means that we're in a driver's seat. Wow, that's absolutely amazing. And, uh, and, and you told me, so tell me a little bit more about these tests because I think the audience was gonna be pretty shocked at like what it takes to pass these tests and how strict it is. So tell us a little bit more about how that test was passed because uh, I thought it was pretty, it was pretty awesome. The SAE test is formidable. <laughs> it took, a month's time, 16 to 18 hour days, seven days a week. We were in Austin, Texas. It is one of the most incredible things to have, go through. It, it took us eight plus years to get to that point. So we just quietly developed and stayed true to our form and our vision to get to that point so that we could bring a technology to the table tested in a third party laboratory approved by SAE. The test, first and foremost, the electromagnetic field test, which is what people think about with wireless charging, will it hurt animals, will it hurt people, will it hurt any kind of living, living organisms? That's what comes to mind, it's the electromagnetic field. And by the way, the earth is surrounded by an electromagnetic field. So it's constantly ambient while we're moving around and living our normal lives. The difference is, is that when you're transferring power over a gap and you have a high voltage, high current type of system, there is going to be a high field there. And so the intensity of the field is measured and you gotta be within a cap, a threshold to ensure that no living organism people, animals won't be harmed by it, mm -hmm. which we were 10 times below the requirement, wow. just to put that point out there. The other part is, is then there's this uh, noise floor, and it has to do with all the other electronics that exist uh, in the world. Everything creates noise, this interference, and they can interfere with each other. And there's obviously critical uh, elements that we do not want to interfere with power lines and grids and these kinds of things, you do not want to interrupt those because of obvious reasons. 
So there's these interference requirements that you have to meet and there's a noise floor. And we were the only company to successfully fall below that noise floor. And so the final test was then to test interoperability with one of our primary competitors. And to be frank about it, we didn't know if it was gonna work, uh, <laughs> but we used the standard, we followed it to the T. First time we turned it on, it worked the way it should. And so after four weeks of these tests, we walked away feeling like victors. It was great. It was a momentous occasion for all of us. We celebrated wonderfully. And then we got to work completing the UL test. So the UL test takes a quite a different approach to how the SAE test works, where it's going to measure how the system actually safely works. One of those tests, fire hose test, directly pointed at the equipment for 10 minutes at a volume rate of 200 liters per minute from about a meter away. And it has to be hermetically sealed not one droplet of water is allowed to be within the enclosure whenever they finish. This is not an easy thing to do. A fire hose pointed directly at a piece of equipment is probably not something that you would expect to have ever happen, but that's how serious they take it. The type of material requirements that we have for our equipment. If you look at a rating of how UL rates their types of materials, we are at the very highest echelon of requirements. You cannot get any higher unless you go into space material. Mm -hmm. So this equipment has been developed with all the things in mind, including hot weather and cold weather. We are rated for negative 40 Celsius to 85 Celsius, which gives us the range to be able to go from anywhere from Alaska to Dubai. It is built to be able to be driven over. It has a 20,000 GAWR. Uh, up to rating on that. It has also been fully chemical and dust uh, tested. And the technology simply works. That's all it needs to do is work. When you pull up, it charges. It's wonderful. You walk away. And now you can go do whatever else you want to do instead of thinking about your charging. Well, wow, that is absolutely amazing. And that is one of the reasons why I was like, wait a minute, you have a, the, the fire hose test alone. I'm sitting here thinking about like what it takes. And that, that moment and that moment in time when you're like, we, like, as you just mentioned, we didn't know if it was going to work and it worked the first time. Talk about relief. The whole, your whole team must have been like, oh, thank you. <laughs> We certainly did not know about the fire hose test. <laughs> they didn't tell us concretely about a fire hose test. We knew we were going to get water tested. We didn't realize it was going to be a fire hose. That's a completely different object of uh, use. So it was relieving. And again, it was a great compliment to the technical team, the engineering staff that put all their time and effort into building this. It obviously would not have happened without that kind of granularity of purpose and focus. And that's really what has made us different. What really that's separates that. us in general is just that how much emphasis we put into the design of our products. And you're going to see it in a minute. Fantastic. And before we go on this demo, because I do want to go in, I just want to, I want to highlight one thing that I don't want to glance over this because this is first off, just congratulations. This is amazing. So you, you sold out, like how quick was that again? 1100 units for your production capacity already immediately. Yeah. How fast was that again? Let's not just okay, glance over weeks. that because you've been working for years for that one, Jeremy. So that's a win yes, you, to, you own. Three weeks. We get, we finished UL testing in August and by the end of August, we already had all the orders that we had, could take for production capacity in 2021. It actually, we had to go and stop taking orders and then reconsider how we're going to increase our volume of production. And our production's in the United States. We're, we're producing in Austin, Texas. So we needed to make sure that our contract manufacturer, who is, by the way, Flextronics, can sustain that, which they absolutely can. That's why we selected them as our manufacturing partner. Fantastic. Uh, All right, now I, I can't wait anymore. Let, let's go on this demo, Jeremy. Take us on the demo. All right, let's go. All right, Jeremy, come on, man. I'm excited about this demo. What you got to show me? Yeah, welcome to my garage. I'm gonna take you through this. So give me a moment, I'm gonna switch my camera. 
I'm going to show you what we have here. So first, you've got the power station, which is the wide enclosure device. And you can see we've got it all in this pedestal mount, what we call the pole mount. You have both options. You can either take that power station and mount it to the wall, or you can pole mount it the way it is. Now, this technology here is rated for eight kilowatts. So it's considered a level two charger. However, at this location, I've got 240 volts, single phase, 50 amp. So just a washer and dryer plug, nothing special there. Mm. But what's inside of this enclosure is very special because in there we have the wireless charging inverter. And by the way, we also have a plug-in charging technology in there. So you can add a plug-in charger if you want to. There's a connector right here. And you can either add a holster to the pole mount or off to the side onto the wall. So you've got both wireless and plug-in charging in one device. We're the only company in the world that offers that. Additional pieces here about this technology. It's a fully connected, very smart device. And I say very, because you're gonna see that in a moment what that looks like, but it comes standard equipped with the ability to connect with LTE, 4G, Wi-Fi, ethernet, and it also has GPS built inside. It does have an LED display that is hidden behind the front polycarbonate cover and that displays through. So we have it behind the polycarbonate cover to protect it against UV and it does display ultra bright. You can see it from over 30 feet away in direct sun as clear as day. A couple other important nuances about this technology. It does come equipped with a certified revenue grade energy meter. It's both UL and MID. So that means it's certified for North America as well as being certified for Europe. And it means then that this technology is able to go anywhere in the world and operate as soon as you connect it in. Now you can see here, we've got it connected by a conduit to our power pad and the wireless power pad, in my case, in my garage, I have mm -hmm. it surface mounted, but you can also embed it into the street seamless like a manhole cover. So you can do either surface mount or flush mount. You have both options there. And again, it has a polycarbonate top and so there's a grid mesh there for anti-slippage. It also ensures that we're meeting American Dis Disability Act requirements or ADA compliancy. And then there is an aluminum bezel around the perimeter there that helps to pro provide side impact resistance against street sweepers and snow plows. So we have built this thing fully in mind with knowing that it can go into somebody's home garage, but also it's gonna be used in industrial and public locations, and that is what it's built for. Now, that wireless power pad is approximately one yard by one yard, and it's about two inches uh, deep. So when we look at the equipment that's on the vehicle, and here in my case, in this garage, I've got the Nissan Leaf. It's a 2012, so it's a pretty dated electric vehicle, but it still gets the job done. I'm very happy to have it. It's been our car for testing and demoing for quite some time. So I've got it opened up here because I'm gonna show you a couple of pieces. First is, is that uh, just to get somebody uh, really quickly sped up on what is an electric vehicle charging system look like? Well, they're all over the place on vehicles, but in the Nissan Leaf here, you've got the black connector, which is a DC charger. And you've got this orange connector, which is an AC charger. The DC charger is the fast charger. And you can see there's all this orange cabling and things that runs through the system. And it really converts that energy to the used uh, DC that the vehicle wants. And in most vehicles, especially what we consider light duty, mid duty and heavy duty vehicles, those electric vehicles are typically gonna to want to have 400 volt DC. So our system is nested in, in terms of our wireless battery adapter, it's nested in between this uh, manifold and this bumper discreetly. And you can barely see it. There's a black enclosure in there. There's a yellow cable. And that is what's feeding the wireless power being transferred from this wireless pad to the vehicle. And there is one last component that's responsible for receiving the power from the wireless pad, which is underneath the vehicle here. We've got the vehicle receiver. So the wireless vehicle receiver center mounted between the two front tires. It's asymmetric in design in terms of the size. So it's approximately 40% the size of this wireless power pad. 
And that means then it makes parking alignment really simple. As long as you have that wireless power yeah. pad on the vehicle side it is able to be somewhere on this wireless power pad on the ground, you're gonna get a highly efficient charge. And this pad is such a large pad. So if we go over here, give me a moment. Now I'm gonna switch over. Just one second. Okay, so now we're in the car here. We're gonna do a quick spin and show this demonstration of what the user experience like. As you can see, we got the Nissan Leaf 2012 that has been selected. That's at the top of the screen there. So if I needed to change my vehicle, I could simply go down to the car icon in the bottom right. I tap on that, I hit the downward arrow, and then it allows me to select another vehicle if I'm driving a different vehicle that day. But I've got the Nissan Leaf. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna tap on that pin. And when I tap on that pin, it brings up some details about the location and different types of chargers. In this case, I'm gonna charge at the charger named Scenic Cottage. So I hit start charge and then the magic begins. So now that LED display on the front cover of that power station is displaying the same number. So that way I know I'm arriving to the charger that was assigned to me. Hmm. And that's really an important development because that doesn't exist today. And people have a hard time finding chargers because there's nothing there to say, hey, I'm your charger. So now I'm gonna simply start pulling forward, which I've started to do. And when I'm about five meters from the actual power pad, it automatically goes into parking alignment. And we've gamified it to make it easy to help people assist them with parking alignment. So you'll see that my car is pulling up here with me. Mm -hmm. Park, parking accuracy is 100%. That's really where I wanna be at least. I turn the vehicle off, I hit start charging. And there's always this reminder that you need to turn your vehicle off in order to charge. That's the case today. In the future, vehicles will be able to drive and charge wirelessly, and that's gonna be a whole new thing. So here, we're starting to charge, and a couple of really key aspects about that makes us better in terms of EV charging and the general experience is that the majority of plug-in chargers do not provide the state of charge to you remotely. Mm. So you have to physically come back to the charger. And that is a problem uh, for a lot of reasons. If you live in a 15 you know, story building, <laughs> you don't wanna take the elevator down to go check on your vehicle. Uh, one other thing to note is uh, that we are always calculating time. Uh, we do have the power being delivered to the car. In this case, it's six kilowatts or so. We show the efficiency. A lot of people worry about wireless charging and efficiency. And so we take the next step of showing them the efficiency, which is actually being measured from outlet to battery. And we want them to know that because then they know they're getting a highly efficient charge. And in most cases, it's gonna be as good as plug-in charging and even better in terms of total efficiency. Uh, the percentage gain, you can see we've got about 0.7% already added to the battery. And when I tap on this card, now it shows how much time I have remaining for a charge. So if I was traveling on a journey, it would tell me, hey, you need to go ahead and get back in your car and continue your journey. But since in this case, I'm charging at home, it's gonna be to a full battery. And it shows me something else that's really important in this detail, my running total in terms of the cost. Mm -hmm. So we have that because A, I'm here at home, so I'm, I'm seeing how much it's costing me for me to charge here at my home with the energy. But if I was charging while I was, I was on a journey and I was paying as I go, it would show me that information as well. And you can set limitations there. You can say, hey, I wanna stop at $5 and it'll stop at $5. So I'm gonna stop charging here and we're gonna see what the receipt looks like. So we've got the cost, we've got the miles gained, we've got the power consumed, we've got the CO2 emissions saved. One thing that's really important for people, especially early adopters as they're buying electric vehicles is what is their impact? They know that electric vehicles are better for the environment. They know that renewables are better for the environment, but often we don't know exactly how we are actually impacting any of that. So we just give that information very clearly here so they can see that in this case, you know, you saved a couple of grams of CO2, but if you've been charging the whole day, you're gonna say quite a bit more. So that's the end of our demonstration here. I'm gonna go ahead and get back to the other location. 
All right, Jeremy. So after watching that demo, I have to tell you, I understand why you stole you sold out of 1,100 units in two to three weeks. Uh, it, it's pretty obvious. Like, what an amazing product, and uh, and I can see how this is going to change the industry. So I have to ask you. So you sold out 1,100 units in uh, two to three weeks. So are, are the big question I know people are asking themselves watching this: Are you taking on investment? Like, what does that part of the of the equation look like? Can't grow this industry without investment. It's required. And yes, we do have an open round right now. Our series A1 is open. And so th if there are investors that are interested in what we're doing, and we really hope there are, <laughs> we would encourage you to reach out to us and we can provide that kind of information at the tail end of this podcast. One thing to state to this is that uh, we've been quite successful in a couple of really important points leading up to this, as we've already gone through and you saw the demo. <laughs> I hope you want one too. <laughs> so, uh, but what it really gets down to is that we need to start delivering on our products and now, because the market has demand right now. So it's going to be a two, three, four year aftermarket spree for us, especially since we're producing, we're the only company in the world with a commercializable production that is there ready to take orders. And as far as we know, that's not gonna change for a couple of years. But what we do know is that for certain, automakers are keying in on a wireless charging transition. And that in the course of the next two, three, four years, we'll see automakers preparing what they need on their side to bring it out natively on the vehicles. So this native option will come out somewhere around 2024, 2025, and we'll start to make that transition effect. What's also happening in parallel with that is autonomy. Autonomous electric vehicles and wireless charging marry up better than peanut butter and jelly. It is required if you have a car that can do turn-by-turn -turn navigation and drive itself, that it can charge itself. It's a requirement. Who wants to plug in their car that drove into a garage? It doesn't make any sense for the user experience. So these automakers obviously understand that. They want to complete a whole user experience, not just a part of it. And where they're focusing their dollars at, if you look at where they're putting their purse, it's in two things, charging and autonomy. And you can bet that wireless charging will be that technology that unleashes all the other inevitable technologies that will be coming out over the next five to 10 years. One final point to this is that, just like with wireless charging phones, back to that analogy, is that once that effect has started to happen, all makers will have it on their vehicles because every single phone made after 2018 has wireless charging in it, same will be the case with your electric vehicles. So today, yeah, we're talking about an aftermarket product. Uh, there are ways to get that done. We have a couple of really great announcements to make on those pieces, which is quite simply that we've been given the green light by Nissan and by Tesla that we can do aftermarket retrofits on their customers' vehicles, and they don't have to worry about knowing their warranty. How incredible is that? That you can go out and get your Nissan Leaf or your MV200 or whatever model of Tesla that you have and go from a plug-in charging technology to wireless. Wow, Jeremy. So that's a pretty big deal. So I want to make sure I understood you correctly. So what you're telling me is that if somebody is, uh, they just rolled off the lot with a brand new Tesla, or maybe they have a Tesla they've had for a long time, and they want to get their car retrofitted with your product, that they can do this and it's not going to null the vehicle. Am I hearing that right? You are hearing that right. Consumers are protected under something called the Moss Magnuson Act. And that's what allows them to do aftermarket retrofits to any vehicles without that kind of concern. And so it does apply here, but we wanted to take the extra step to make sure that those automakers were going to apply that as well with our wireless charging technology, which is what we did. So we are at a good point here for anybody to be able to retrofit their vehicles with our wireless charging technology. 
Well, that's absolutely amazing. And you've come quite a long way for, uh, for HEVO. I mean, a lot, lot of years working on this and to, to pass the SAE test and to get to where you're at. I mean, it's just absolutely an amazing accomplishment and to sell out, by the way. So let's not, let's not glance over that one. 1,100 units or so um, in, in about three weeks. Like, that's crazy. Um, and I know now you're, you're raising capital, you're scaling, all the other things that come with uh, the success that you're experiencing. So congrats on that if somebody is watching this right now and they want to learn more about hevo because they, either they're an investor or they just want to connect and learn more about the brand or or get on that list to buy the product i mean what's the best way for them to do that yeah they can go to hevopower.com or they can also reach out to us through any of our social media sites so we're on linkedin we're on twitter and we're on facebook but also you can reach out to us at hello at hevopower.com Fantastic. Well, Jeremy, been awesome having you on the show today. Wishing you much more continued success with Hevo. And to the audience, as always, thank you for tuning in. Hope you got a lot of value out of this. If you did, don't forget, subscribe to the podcast. Uh, if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, definitely hit the subscribe button there. But also leave us some comments in the video. Love to know what kind of projects and things that you're working on. And Jeremy, thanks again for coming on the show. It's been great.